Hey everybody, this is Mario Dennis here, your host for the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today we are going to be doing something a little bit different. Today we are not doing anything with real estate. I have my good friend James JT Taylor, who is my old boxing coach. He owns a boxing gym and is a partner in a mixed martial arts gym in town. And we're going to be talking about fitness and working out and shit that has nothing to do with real estate, hopefully, because that's the goal is to do something a little bit different for the audience. How are you doing, man? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Yes, sir. No bad. Not bad. You know, it's interesting because we're not going to be doing the real estate talk, but I met you through real estate. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting because... Uh, when we met, you had just gotten your real estate license, mm-hmm. but you had a one very specific goal for that license. And tell us a little bit about that story. So the ultimate goal was to make enough money to start a gym because I just left um, SWAT MMA and we left upon the different reasons. But, you know, uh, we want to discuss that. But uh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, but I mean, the ultimate goal, start real estate make enough money, open up a gym and do it exactly what I want to do. You know, so real estate wasn't my goal, but yeah. So it was a vehicle for you to get to the gym. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which is really, you know, for someone listening to this, that's a real estate agent that might be struggling for leads or something. They will listen to this and be like, what? (laughs) Because when I met JT, we were both coming into the same office at the same time. Mm -hmm. And JT knows everyone in this town like this <laughs> dude literally puts his hand up anywhere and there's 20 people that know him so in a matter of a couple of years you closed a few million dollars worth of business made all the money you needed to to open your gym and you were like okay i'm done with real estate that's not, crazy yes i mean i feel like my purpose in the game or whatever you want to call it is to help kids out mentor kids you know be there for them because a lot of people are not. And now nowadays, we're literally just letting our kids go. And they just loose. They're like wild animals. So why not? You know, and I felt like that was my purpose. Not to sell homes. Yeah, the money's good. But at the end of the day, it's not about the money. It's more yeah. so about helping these kids become gentlemen, become women. You know. Yeah. It, it's a, you have a very strong calling, mm-hmm. which is something that not a lot of people have, especially not nowadays, right? Like. I feel like 50 years ago, someone would grow up and be like, I want to be a policeman or I want to be a firefighter or I want to be a boxer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since they were kids, they would be doing that and always knew what they wanted to do. But nowadays, there's so many options and so much information being thrown at kids that that there isn't there isn't a lot of people with a strong calling that you had for this. You know, you wanted the gym because you love boxing and you love fitness. Mm -hmm. But also for you, it was a it was a way to get kids off the streets exactly. and teach them discipline, teach them you know um, a skill and all that stuff. Yeah, um, for my upbringing, you know, that was always been my ultimate goal is to teach kids get out of the box because some kids live in the box, but they never explore out of the box. So if you give them that opportunity to explore out of the box, they see different things that they can open their mind to. And that's my ultimate goal is to get those kids out of the box. Now, when you say things like, um, oh, I, can't, I can't even think right now. I'm losing my mind. Um, what, you, what did you say before that? Yeah, that I, I, w- I was telling you that how, how you have such a strong calling for it, mm-hmm. but not a lot of people do. Like a lot of people have like, there's all this information being thrown at kids and being thrown yes. at people nowadays. So like one minute they want to do one thing, one minute they want to do the next thing. And, you know, the crazy thing with you particularly was... You wanted to do real estate as a way to get into, you know, to be able to purchase your gym. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people, even through that process, would have probably changed their mind when they experienced the money, which you did. Mm-hmm. But it's still, you still went and did your gym and kissed goodbye with real estate, which was pretty admirable. Yeah, because I mean, like looking nowadays, back in the day, we had like realistic goals where you want to be a fireman, a police officer. Now you want to be a YouTuber, you know, yeah. or a gamer. Yeah. And who who would know who would have known that you could make money off of being playing games? So now you got too many options. You yeah, know? yeah, and I think you know. I just saw a statistic recently that says something like seventy percent of the jobs in twenty fifty have not been created yet. Wow! You know, to your point of like 
And there's a lot of people making a lot of money on YouTube. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people making a lot of money gaming. There's a lot of people making money blogging, doing videos, Instagram, whatever, yeah. you know, like the modeling thing, girls on Instagram, you know, monetizing their channels, you know, it's pretty incredible all the things that you can do nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and Snapchat, they, you know, doing videos on Snapchat makes money now, you know, any, pretty much any social media can make money, especially if you have a lot of followers, you know, with millions of followers, what happens to the sponsors, you know, they want to come in, they want to sell them their product. So it's an outlet for these guys. Yeah. Tell me, t- tell me how the community has received you and sort of like some of the programs that you're doing with kids nowadays. So I deal with um, like the Lake County Police Department. Um, if they have a troubled youth that they want to bring into the gym, I don't charge them. You know, they just come to my gym. I have parents that come to me because they have adolescent kids that don't want to listen. They might not have their father in their life. And I'm kind of like that, that substitute for them. I'm not trying to be the kid's dad, but, you know, I'm giving him that feel. Okay, you know, I got to make sure coach is straight because I don't want to do, I don't want to do wrong by coach. And a lot of parents come to me because that, because of that, a lot of the, um, the police officers, they'll just drop kids off in my front door and like, yo, can you help this kid? Leave him. I got him. You know? Um, so, and, um, Mineola, the city, the city hall of Mineola, when they have their council meetings, they talk about me a lot. Um, because of that, you know, I got top three, two, th- uh, three of the top kids in the nation at my gym, mm-hmm. you know, in a small town of Mineola, super small, but we, we're making noise. You know, why, why do you think that is? It's not much to do in Mineola. <laughs> it's like right. the main thing. You either out there doing bad or you out there doing something positive. You know, it's, it's one or the other. And if I can keep these kids attention off the bat, then they got no choice but to do good. You know, and, you know, a lot of people listen to this and they'll be like, you know, boxing is such a violent sport, you know, like people sometimes, you know, and I feel like that stigma has dropped off a little bit, especially with MMA coming on the fold. And, you know, you see people take, a, you know, what physically looks like more damage at, le- at least on some of the MMA fights. But still, for some people, it's like, I don't want my kid getting beat up in boxing. And a lot of people don't understand that boxing is probably a 5% punching and then there's 95% of other. Yes. Um, can you fill in the blanks or, or how do you deal with that when a parent talks to you about it? Okay, so a parent brings a six-year-old in the gym. I don't want my kid to get a black eye. Okay, he's not pro. He's not in that atmosphere yet, nowhere near it. You know, he's going to learn the basics of boxing. He's going to learn the footwork. He's going to learn the, high, the eye-feet coordination, the balance. He's going to learn all those things before he even think about getting in the ring. And even if they get in the ring, think about when two kids push each other, are they really pushing each other hard? No, they're not. And we don't do the contact with the little guys until they get a little bit older. But even when they get 10 years old, they're not hitting at all hard. You know, one kid hits with like 10% power, the other kid hit with 15% power. They're not grown men. So they don't have, they don't have that full power, full strength like the, like the older guys do. So when you see it like on TV and it's, it's, it's brutal, yeah, it is. You know, it's a tough sport. It's, it's, um, it's a gladiator sport. But... In the beginning, it's the discipline that you learn. It's the footwork that you learn, the athleticism. You know, you, you can come in not knowing anything. You can be a star football player or a football player that really sucks, and you do boxing. You step back on the football field, it's a different ballgame now because you have balance. You have footwork. You, had, you, add a, you add an arsenal to your game. You know, you, you, if you come in with, like, a, let's say, a level two out of athleticism, you know, then – by the time you do boxing, you're maybe a five or a six, but it helps out every single sport that you do. Boxing is like the go-to. Yeah, and you've worked with some professional athletes. Yeah, I got, oh, I got a couple of them, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, You know, when I was going to the gym regularly, we would run into these guys all the time, you know, whether it was, you know, professional soccer player or football player or, you know, MMA fighters or whatever. And, you know, I don't think boxing gets credit for all the things that it does. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, because people think it's a very um, monochromatic sport. You know, you throw punches and you try to avoid getting hit, you know. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot more to it. There is, you know, the core workouts for boxing are ridiculous. The cardio of boxers mm-hmm. is absolutely ridiculous. So there's a lot more to it. And if you bring your kid, probably one of the good things is you don't want to learn a skill about that has to do with hitting when you, to your point, when you have power and when the other guy has a lot of power. Mm-hmm. But when they're kids, it's a good time because no one really has power and they can learn the skill without mm-hmm. taking damage. Yes, very true. But who would have thought like 
Justin Gatlin with walking to the gym. He's a track star. He runs. You know, that's what he does. But yet he uses boxing as like, you know, as an off season training, you know, so, you know, so many different things you bring. Yeah, I think we're in a time, you know, and I always kind of like, you know, the ultimate debate, right, is like NBA players today versus back in the days, you know, the old timers are always like, oh, man, you know, like the 95 Bulls would beat anybody. And I'm like, Mm -mm. no, no, no way. No, it's like. (laughs) You have centers. <laughs> you, you have seven footers now that make three pointers. You know, at thirty percent, just handling you know, right. the rock, and they can handle the ball and they can play defense. And oh yeah, and they move like John Stockton did. Only they're they're LeBron size. You know. Yes. You know, one of the inter- things that I love and it's very interesting about athletics is that the cross training has been making this like super athletes mm-hmm. out of people and. Boxing is just one of those things, like you say, Justin Gatlin added to his resume, you know, mm-hmm. because it just makes him 1% better at the mm-hmm. thing that he does. And if you do enough of those 1% here and there, you know, yeah, that's what up. sets you apart. Yes, that is very true. Um, I, so I just did this parkas and things. Um, it's called Rocksteady Boxing. And they have a triangle of, app, of all the f- sports, you know, things that you can do, soccer, swimming, tennis. Boxing's at the top. Reason. Footwork hand, feet, coordination, and mental state. A lot of people don't think about the mental state that comes in with it because you have to think. You're not just throwing punches. A lot of people think that you're just throwing punches, but you have to move out of the way. You have to create angles. You have to dodge punches. You know, it's so many things that you bring to the table that constantly makes you think, think, think. Plus, you got to move. Plus, it's so much, you know, stuff yeah. to it. Yeah, and that's what I, That's one thing that I, loved about, I love about what you do is Again, there's that that stereotype that is such a simple sort of monochromatic thing, and and boxing is anything but. And that's why it permeates to other sports. And I wanted to talk to you about the Parkinson's thing because I saw you post in social media working with some Parkinson's patients. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that program and kind of one of what are some of the benefits that you're seeing and your patients see and um, how the whole thing works out and it came about? Okay, so. I had a client link that um, came into the gym. Um, they had Parkinson's. They, um, they was referred from a chiropractor. And he's like a level five, very high on the Parkinson's. But it doesn't he before me, he didn't do anything. He would sleep, eat, wake up, sleep, eat, wake up. So he was basically going down real fast. Um, his wife, which we call, they're like um, cornermen. She brought him in, said, supposedly there's a thing that says rock steady can help. So can you do mitt work with him? So, yeah, of course, you know, so obviously it's a slow pace, very, 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 very slow. But as the weeks started going on, he started progressing. He started getting up at six o'clock in the morning. He started mowing his grass, washing his cars, washing the dog. He started doing way more things. So he went from like a level five to like a level three fast within a month. It's just something to keep him active and boxing. Not, you know, you know, Parkinson's is more neurological. So boxing is you got to work your brain. You got to move your feet. You got to move your hands. You got to have a little bit of balance. And Parkinson knocks off your balance. Depends on what level you're on, you know. Um, You have, you know, um, you shake a little bit, you know. So it's like that control when you're throwing punches, it kind of like slows it down. It's not necessarily, it would never prevent it because um, Parkinson's, there's no cure for it. Sure. But it slows it down completely. You know, not all the time. Some, Some patients are different from others, but... It helps in like tremendous ways. And then just an overall experience in themselves, making them feel better about themselves, confident, you know, like, you know, I can do this. Yeah. And that's the mental aspect of all these things, especially, you know, I think, you know, thankfully I haven't been there, but I think if you could diagnose with something like that, that, you know, there's no cure for it, you know, it has to be such a heavy burden to carry and to be able to be welcomed somewhere we are doing this thing which feels good to you and you're around people that believe in you, that are mm-hmm. teaching you and being patient with you. And that has to have an, an incredible um, uplifting effect on those people, for sure. No question about it. Yeah, because once they get the notice that they have Parkinson's, you know, it takes them like six months to like really dissect it. Like, wow, I have Parkinson's, you know. And we don't want them to feel bad about it. We want them to feel like it's nothing. Continue to do what you do. Live your life. Don't ever stop. Because a lot of people, they get something and they stop. And that's when life hits. You know, just ignore it completely. Then train your body to actually, you know, ignore it. So 
it, it makes it easier for them to just go on with regular with life, but just add on something now. Just because you got something on me, you got to stop. And are, are you going to be actively like trying to market that a little bit more, just kind of getting the word out? Because I never heard about it before. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I have a, a pretty wide range of friends in my social media. I've never heard of this before. So um, it was really interesting to see you working on it. Yeah, so I had to go to Canada to um, to get certified in the Rocksteady. Um, there's a whole process that you have to go through with the schooling and everything. So we got certified, we got licensed, we got the whole nine yards. Um, there's like six in the state of Florida, and we're one of them. Um, Lake County, I chose. Um, so we're Lake County, we're Rock City, Rocksteady, Lake County, because you have the villages, you have Oca- oh, not Ocala, but I mean you have Leesburg, you have the area, and we're like the ultimate vacation spot, right? Pretty much. So our elders are here. And retirement. Exactly. So. Um, this is like the center and it's like perfect because a lot of people that have Parkinson's here go to rock steady downtown Orlando, mm. you know? So why drive, you know, they're elders. They shouldn't have to trick, take a 45 minute drive to go downtown to go train for an hour to come back. Sure. When it's right here in your backyard. So that's why with, we, with me training Howard and watching how he progressed, it made me want to help more because there's a lot of other people out there that need the help, you know? Yeah, and if you're listening to this and you're curious about it, um, JT, you can find him on Instagram or Facebook as James Taylor or James JT Taylor, mm-hmm. and also Technique Boxing, and that's T E K N I Q U E Boxing. Yeah. Um, and there's videos of how you're working with these patients, uh, amongst many other things. Um, but let's talk about some other things too, because I haven't talked to you in a little while and there's some other exciting stuff happening because every time I turn on my social media, you're either (laughs) beating the shit out of someone (laughs) or someone you're training is beating the shit out of someone. So what's going on? We making moves. Um, so I got back into fighting. Um, I took a good layoff. Um, my last fight was 2017. Before that, my layoff was 2009. That's when you had surgery, right? Yeah. I had appendicitis. So, um, that kind of knocked me off of it. And, but that really got me into the training aspect. Um, so with my injury, it stopped me from fighting, but it allowed me to show people my skill and teach people my skill. And that's where technique came alive. Yeah. You know, so, but now I mean, right now I got to fight November 2nd. Um, I took two fights within the month, um, back to back. <laughs> um, both of those fights ended in the second round. So now I'm three and oh, three KOs and 36 years old. And a lot of people say, all right, he's 36. So they'll take the fight. Not realizing my coach calls me. A, he says I'm a brand new Cadillac that's been sitting in the garage. Yeah, not much damage. Yes. So yes. and and that's the advantage that I have. So when they see my age, they don't realize well, what they're walking into. Um, there is that, and there is you know, amateur fighters always you know, and the guys starting out, they have to have a job. Like you know, mm-hmm. you know, starting out fighting doesn't pay the bills for yeah. sure. You know, so you have this guy who's like you know, an IT guy or whatever, you know, a sales guy in a dealership, Mm -hmm. you know, training an hour a day or two hours a day or whatever the case might be to take a fight with a dude like you that's spending 10 hours a day (laughs) doing mid work, foot work and watching every mistake that everyone else makes (laughs) and correcting that. That is what people don't understand sometimes when they're getting in the ring with you, I think. Yeah, the IQ is very strong. So um, I can pick you apart pretty quick. You make one move, I notice it immediately because I'm a coach at the day. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a coach. Yeah. So it's almost like I'm coaching these guys. I'll be wanting to tell them, like, no, don't do that. But then I'm fighting them. So are you listening to your <laughs> corner or are you doing your own thing? I do my own thing. Yeah. Um, Marco is a is a hell of a coach, you know, um, but I don't get a chance to really train with him because he's a winter haven and I'm here. So I really train myself. You know, I do mid work and stuff like that to keep everything tight. But other than that, I'm really coaching myself while I'm in there. Now, when I get in the corner, he shows me things. He tells me things that I can't see. Because obviously, you can't see everything. You need a coach. Sure. You got to have a coach, no matter what. I don't care who you are. Yeah, in a different angle. Yes, you got to have a coach because he can see things that you can't see. So, um, when I'm in the corner, now he adjusts. Okay, this this is open. Ah, oh, I didn't even notice that. Boom, bingo. Got it. Now, now I can take advantage of it completely. And then most of the time, my opponents already beat the first round because they see my speed. I'm faster than the majority of these guys out here, even I'm older, you know? Yeah. And, and the other thing is you are fighting at one thirty, mm-hmm. at one thirty, right? Yeah. And you hit like a one seventy. Yeah. Um, they call me a middleweight. Yeah. Yeah. You're a very small middleweight. <laughs> um, I'm 
again, some of those things that people probably don't know walking into it. And, you know, I always say that it's difficult sometimes to fight at an amateur level in the sense that you don't have footage on the other guy. Like you're walking into a total unknown. You don't know what you're what yeah. the other guy fights like. So you have to do like a well-rounded, you know, training program leading up to the fight because you don't know if you have a counter puncher, you don't know if you have, you know, what you're standing in front of. Mm -hmm. But to that point, I think the biggest disadvantage is someone walking in and feeling that first punch coming from you, which I've felt personally <laughs> and being like, oh, fuck. <laughs> It's going to be a long night. Yeah, it changes your mind. Or not very long, but <laughs> well, however long it is, it's going to feel much longer. Yeah, and I, I get that. Like, a lot of people think, thinking, like, the, the tier guys that I'm fighting are not on my level. Obviously, you know what I'm saying, they're low-tier guys. But that's how you start in boxing. If you look at anybody's record, their first 10 fights, what are their records, really? You know, um, so you're just getting your feet wet. But you can fight a really good guy, but the first punch, that changes the game. They either want to fight you or they don't after that point. And most of the time when I lay my left hand on them, that whole experience, they want to get away from me. You know, so down there on defense, when you're on defense with me, that's a bad person. That's a bad place to be. Yeah, I saw it. Um, the second fight, um, and, and people really need to look it up on Instagram and in your Facebook, but the second fight when you hit the guy um, with the left that sent the mouthpiece flying into the... <laughs> like the eighth row of the stance. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it I caught actually, me by surprise, too. When, it, when, it, when I hit him, boom, I looked for a second, like, whoa. And then I'm thinking, mouthpiece out, teeth are vulnerable at this point. You know, yeah. teeth are, I'm trying to take the front, the two fronts out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a bad way to look at it, but when you're in the ring. That's, that's what you're there for. Yes, you're there to do a job. Exactly. When you're in the ring, I don't look at the referee as a person that's stopping the fight. I look at the referee as like the person to save your life. Yeah. That's his job. My job is to take you out. His job is to make sure I don't completely take you out. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, and you see sometimes, you you know, we've gone sometimes to the amateur fighting, It's you know, especially when I was at the gym. And one of the things that you notice sometimes when people are new is that they get on the ring and they're always kind of like paying attention to the ref. Like mm -hmm. they think the ref is, is another competitor on the ring. They're always like, you know, they, they'll land a couple of hands and they want to look at the ref to see what he's <laughs> going to do. And it's like, don't mm -hmm. worry about it. Just, just mm -hmm. do your thing. If he has to jump in, he'll make himself noticed. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's the referee is blind to me. You know, um, there's no other person in the ring besides the, my opponent. And, you know how they say, like, you're, you're nervous. Yeah, you're nervous on the outside, but as soon as you get in the ring, you're home. I always tell my guys, as soon as you get in the ring, you're home in the four corners, period. So you should be not be nervous. And the referee is the last person you're worried about. You're worried about your opponent because the referee is either going to pull you off or pull him off. And don't be the guy that's getting, you know. Yeah, and I think that's a good lesson for anything in life. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a goal, kind of block away all the distractions yes. and yes. just go for the goal. And if... If something so major has to get on the way, it'll make itself noticed. Like you don't have to be paying attention to him for a subtle movement. He, if he has to jump in. He's gonna jump on your back if he needs to. You know that's yeah, exactly. that's that's their job. Um, you are a lefty, mm -hmm. but you're a southpaw lefty. The same thing. Southpaw is a lefty. Yeah, you're yeah. a southpaw lefty. Yeah. So, um, is that that's kind of unusual when you are on the ring? You know because. I see everybody when they see your stands, like the guys that you fought, they seem to be like out of sorts at the beginning. They so, don't know how to deal with that. Now, okay, so I'm Southpaw and it's 10% of us. Now it's yeah. a lot more Southpaws are coming out, but there's right handers now training themselves to fight Southpaw. Right, that's what I meant. Yeah. So yeah. you're a natural Southpaw. Yeah, is I'm, what a, I meant. I'm a natural yeah. lefty. Yeah. yeah. So literally, when I say it, my sports side is on my left side, my brain, uh, my business side is on my right side. So I write with my right. Do sports with my left. Mm. So, but um, yeah, it's difficult to fight a southpaw, even for me, you know, even left handers versus left handers, because we're used to going one direction, and that's against, that's on the f outside of the front foot of the right hander. But right handers fight right handers, what, 90% of the time? So when they finally get in front of a southpaw, they move in our direction, which is the wrong direction you're supposed to go in. And it's an advantage for us because we're used to it. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it becomes self evident. Yeah. When, when the first couple of lefts, get uncorked that 
you see people like, oh, that's that's the hand. Yeah, uh, yeah. They and, find out and about they don't it. have an answer for it. Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, I imagine a lot of these guys they probably sparring and they never even seen a left in front of them. Only ten percent mm-hmm. out there. So you know. Yeah. How often are they really training with a guy like that? And even if they are, they're fighting with 16 ounce gloves when they spar. You know, mm-hmm. take half of that glove away. What from size them. gloves were you uh, at the last fight? Um, eight ounces. Oh, wow. That's a small glove for yes, boxing. Very small glove. And it hits hard. <laughs> That's a very small <laughs> glove. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and it's like a brick. When you put the wraps on with that glove, it's like, it's so tight to your hand, it always makes your hand numb. And when your hand goes numb, you can't feel how hard you hit. Are you training with small gloves? Yeah, I do mitt work with eight ounce gloves. Yeah. So like when I do bag work, sixteen ounces, spar with sixteen ounces. But when I do pad work, mitt work, all eight ounces. Because you want to get used to the impact movement, slip and punches. Make sure you have the right size gloves on. Because if you do it with sixteen ounces and you switch to eight ounces, timing's gonna be off. Way off because the speed is different. Yeah. You know so. And you're also working with some MMA guys. Yeah, I have um. My main guy is Julian Williams, Jay Smooth Williams, which is mm-hmm. fighting this Saturday in Kansas. Um, and then I also have... What promotion is he fighting with now? Um, I don't know the promotion. It's like a guy that, that used to fight in the UFC. Okay. And so it's his promotion, and he's the main event. So I, mm. I wonder how that's going to work with him, because it's going to be like, if the show goes to crap, that's and then you got to fight at the end of the show, he's like, yo, you're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bad day to get your ass whooped if it's your promotion and you're the main card. <laughs> oh, man, I hope I hope the show goes well. But at the end of the night, he got to fight my guy. Yeah. And it ain't going to go well for him because yeah. we already got the game plan down. But, you know, at the end of the day, we want a good promotion. Yeah, Julian's a beast. He's yes. such a smart guy. And so underrated. Ever since um, the first fight that I saw him fight in was in Russia. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's when you guys yeah, went to Russia goal. in 2015, 2016 mm-hmm. maybe. Ah, I think fifteen. Like, no, I think it was like thirteen. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. Mm-hmm. I I remember, da- yeah, I remember when you went to Russia, and and it was, it was over quickly. Yeah, Please we wanted say. to get out of Russia, so we wanted to finish it fast. <laughs> 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 Russia was a place that nobody should go. But um, no offense to anybody that's Russian out there. Russia's tough, bro. Yeah, it's tough and it's intimidating. I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it's you're like, half a world away. You don't speak the language and. And You're there talk. to beat the shit out of one of them. And they're one of their best. One yeah. of their guys that's like one, he was number one in the nation for wrestling. And we beat him at his own game. You know, so, it, and they all talk like mobsters. So when you sit next to a guy, you just, can I get a coffee? Yeah, you be, be, what? Yeah. Hold on, what? <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that's gotta be, that's gotta be pretty odd. Um, and he's had a few fights since. Julian is just, again, super smart, super high IQ guy. Mm-hmm. And who is he training with? Jacare Souza, Platinum Mike Perry, Alan Patrick, Alex Nicholson, um, Philly Fresh that just got inside the UFC, yeah. you know, I mean, um, and um, Adolfo, you know, like you got the best grapplers, strikers in the building right now. But, um, Mike yeah, and people that haven't seen Jacare in person, they may not understand <laughs> the size human that he is. He is huge. I remember the first time I met Jacare, I was like, Jeez, this guy is like, he's about 220. Yeah. I mean, brolic. Like, he was, but he wasn't 220. He was like two old, he was 215 when I met him. Yeah. But he looks easy, 220. Yeah. Easy. And he hits like a tank, but he never had striking. He had the ground game down. Yeah. And that's when we started working. So, yeah. And he's become a really good striker. Um, His last four fights, he did really good at striking. But, you know, at the beginning, this is my thing. You don't have it, fine. We'll teach you it. We'll get it right. But always go to your number one. You know, and he's been winning with the striking, but the ones, the fights that he lost, he should have grappled. You know, he should have used both of his things at that point, but he just mm-hmm. really wanted to knock people out and just trying to get him out of there. But seems like it would be fun. Yeah, because I mean, like Chris Wyman, when he knocked him out with a forehead punch, which is the yeah. hardest part of your body, you know, you knocked him out, you punched him in the forehead and you knocked him out. I mean, you hit hard. Yeah, no, I mean, in person, like his hands, it's just like he's just a big human, mm-hmm. like hands shoulders is just like yeah. and he saw it the yeah. pressure the from hearing the guys around me that you know they do the grappling and jiu-jitsu and everything the pressure of jockery is unheard of and now rodolfo you know Vieta, his pressure is identical to jockery if not better because he's a five-time national cha- national champion in um jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. their pressure together is unbelievable and julian pressure matches them 
So, you know. Yeah. When you look at like Philly Fresh that's getting this. Iron, iron sharpens iron. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that's why Philly Fresh is jujitsu is superior now. You know what I'm saying? Because he's grappled with such great guys, you know. And Platinum Mike Perry, he's a striker guy. But nobody's ever seen him grapple. But this dude can grapple too. And he just have his, he has no reason to show it unless he's on that ground. You know, but nobody's handling his striking because he's a strong guy. Not too technical, but man, listen, power wise, <laughs> if he touched you, it's over. Yeah. You know, with Jacare, the same thing. Jacare is getting stronger with his striking. But at the end of the day, we want both. We don't want just you to be a striker. Obviously, you started the game as a yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing about MMA, right? Like, there's so much evo- evolution on that sport, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I think if you take a guy that was even a champion 10 years ago, he would probably not be a top tier guy today in most weight classes. I mean, nice. it's evolved a lot. You have like the super strong wrestlers, super strong jujitsu guys. And now, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, that are the stand up game and the striking has become a lot more specialized and you see it on the footwork. We talked about this a little bit, like. The footwork in MMA is getting there. Yeah. It's getting to where you see, and you're like, "Oh, that's crisp. That's getting, you know." Yeah, because I mean, they're not. They're starting to realize you can't. I mean, it's it's MMA, mixed martial art, mixed martial arts. You have to have every art, and you have to train every one of them. If you're just a jujitsu guy with no striking, you're gonna get exposed. If you can't take the guy to the ground, then what you gonna do? Just swing haymakers all the time? Yeah. So what do you do? You got to work on. And you got to know what to do when you find yourself with a dude sitting on top of you. Exactly. You know, so a lot of these guys are starting to go to boxing gyms because they need footwork. You know, they're going to the Mayweather schools. They're going to work with, um, what's this guy named that just fought? Um, I can't think of his name. He's like one of the best in the world. He started his amateur career. I mean, started his pro career. He was like three, 396 and one. Oh, wow. Chinko. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys yeah. are going to his gym, you know what I'm saying, just for footwork purposes, you know. You, and a lot of guys, like I tell my guys all the time, footwork, 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 footwork. Yeah, and now the thing that I started to see, you know, over the last year probably, um, and Colby Covington is probably like the, the the best example of it is, man, the cardio. Yeah. The cardio, yeah. like the output that these guys have now, because you used to never see that. Yeah. Like, if you see MMA historically, you know, you didn't see that output of, like, what was Colby, like, you know, two punches every second he averaged or mm-hmm. something absurd like that. It was just insane, the cardio that these guys have now. Yeah, it's consistent. Um, some of these guys, they do so much training, and that's why they are so, like, how you say it? Like, um, they train jiu-jitsu and MMA the sparring, everything so much that it puts so much wear and tear on their body. And that's when you have like a 30 year old that just look like an old man or his body's aching so bad and they get injury. If you notice the injury rate is really high, but that's because they train, 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 train. They're not fighting that much, but they're training like crazy every single day. They sparring, training, they're doing something. Boxing is a little bit different. Yeah, and I'm glad to see, like, I, I, I've i been listening lately, and I think a lot of the gyms are backing off from the hard sparring. Yes. Like, yes. The, you know, it used to be this thing, like, you know, in sparring sessions, you used to go all out, and then mm-hmm. people are getting into the fight all fucked up because they've been getting their ass shit, you yep. know, kicked, you know, for months leading up to the fight. They're going in with injuries, they, you know. Yeah. Now they're not doing, you know, the sparring, you know, that super hard sparring consistently because it's just too much. Yeah, they did a um, they did a thing with the medical side where they noticed what well, they did, like a survey take. Sparring was worse than actual fight. Like if you're sparring 24 seven and you only fight once every two, three months, you know, you're getting your right. damage in the sparring. Yeah. You know, and that's why sometimes you can't spar with certain people. Because they, they don't have control, you know. Like, yo, we're going 50%, but you're going 150. Well, and that was a big thing in the bo- old boxing gyms, right? They would do mm-hmm. this wars and these things yeah. where, you know, like 15 minutes of somebody getting their head mm-hmm. rocked, like that stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, 10-minute rounds, 15-minute rounds, the first one to go down, that's the end of the fight, or that's the end of the round. Yeah. You know. Um, I'm glad we're getting smarter with that stuff. Yeah, because, I mean, the injury rate and the deaths. I mean, obviously, the social media and everything like that is so exposed now. This was happening back in the day also. People dying in the ring, people dying in the cage. But now, it's such out. It's so many. It's, it's everywhere. It's heightened, for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So, somebody dies. Everybody got their camera out, you know. And it's not for the men in that ring or that cage. It's prior. Your injuries are prior. Whatever yeah. you did before that, 
that when you got in the ring, you was already hurt. Yeah, and it's funny you because know? you called it at the beginning a gladiator sport, and that's what I always say about um, combat sports and football specifically. You know, those are they're gladiator sports, but we need to do better uh, not treating the athletes themselves like gladiators because yeah. gladiators were disposable. You know, gladiators were slaves that were put to fight, and then you know they were disposed of, and a new one would be brought on, but. Um, we need to get better at it. I'm glad, you know, with the NFL getting a little more conscious with the CTE, I hope yeah. that continues. Um, and then, you know, MMA and boxing definitely, you know, becoming smarter about their training. Like you said, mm -hmm. you know, we don't need to be rocking each other during, you know, sparring leading up to a fight. Like, you know, leave that for the main event. Yeah. Because you're fighting, you know, a couple of times a year at the most if you're a pro, mm -hmm. you know, so you should be able to handle that, I guess. Yeah. If you slow down your sparring, you slow down your timing and your speed. One, you're going to become more accurate. Then you're going to be able to see more things also. You see your mistakes a little bit more than just trying to take somebody's head off. Now, real quick, going back, way back in the beginning of our conversation, yeah. where like parents, they, they, wanna, they don't want to put their kids in boxing. But one thing to realize is you can get a concussion anywhere. You can get a concussion on the baseball field. You can get a concussion on the soccer field. You can get a concussion on the football field. Yeah. Football is like the main one. Um, no, actually, I think it's something else. It's something else that's like out of nowhere. But um, So I had a student. Mom did not want to put the kid in boxing whatsoever. I said, let him try boxing for two months. I even gave it to her on the house, you know? She did not want her kid to have a concussion. The kid was nine years old. One, he was not going to spar, right? Um, the ball, so the kid is home. The ball rolled up under the car. He went up under the car, lifted his head up, boom, concussion. And couldn't train no more. And I'm like, that's not from boxing. You know that, right? Because he didn't spar. You know, she's like, yeah. I don't know. It's, he got a concussion from the ball rolling up under the car, and he hit his head. So when you say, like, concussion rate, you don't want your kid to get hit in the head, it can happen anyway. Yeah. And the last thing, what I would want is my kid to know some kind of a self-defense, to build his confidence, whether he's competing, whether he's sparring or not. He has a self-confidence inside of him now that he's like, I'm capable of doing this and handling myself, you know. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm, you, you know, and I spent all of my life in martial arts at the beginning and then, you know, as an adult in boxing with you and, you know, with the discipline and all of that that comes, I think, I think there is genuine value to for a kid to experience that kind of physical adversity mm -hmm. yeah. um, in a control environment because you never want your kid to ever have to get into a confrontation anywhere but if he does you don't want you don't want that day to become the first time he's ever experienced another human touching them mm -hmm. um you know you want people to be able to get out of that i mean and people will have different opinions on it i get that yeah but anyway. uh, for me it was always very valuable to have that experience to not like Oh, I know what that feels like. Yeah. Like, and like the self-defense, the yeah. self-defense classes drive me nuts because you do one class. What are you going to get out of that? Right. You know, because when you actually put it in real life, somebody run up on you, you did one class. You think you're going to remember all of that? Yeah, no, it's muscle memory. You have to, <laughs> repetition is key. Exactly. You know, repetition mm -hmm. is key for anything. Yeah. And then, you, you know, muscle memory doesn't go anywhere. You remember all it takes is that one flick and then it turns on. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be your natural instinct. But if you don't practice it, it's not a natural instinct. So it's something that you got to do on a consistent basis over and over and over. That way, you know, your natural instincts kick in. Boom. You're good. Yeah. And someone also listening to this that thinks all you do is boxing, hmm. that would also be wrong to assume <laughs> because you work with a lot of adults. You do a lot of personal training. You do one-on-one -on -one classes and you do group classes for people that are looking for weight loss or other fitness goals. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so, yeah, I'm a personal trainer. Um, I love results. That's like my addiction. So I'm like the result dealer. <laughs> um, like you have drug dealers out there. I'm the yeah. result dealer. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, that's my ultimate goal is to get you results because when they say you get results, what it does, it becomes addicting. And when it becomes addicting, you want more, you want to get, you want to see more. And I mean, nowadays we're like the worst country for, you know, health because yeah, isn't it crazy? Like for, if you split humanity, like for 97% or 99% of humanity. So if you take all humans that have ever lived, the thing that we had a problem with was finding enough calories mm -hmm. to stay alive because there was no refrigerators yeah. there, you know, you had to hunt and yeah. that meat would go by that bad after a day or two. So, you know, you then you'd be back you to square one. 
you know, so fine, consuming enough calories was always the problem. But in the United States, that hasn't been a problem for the vast majority of the country for a very long time. Yeah. So we're in this weird situation where it's the opposite. We we got it too good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like if you go overseas, like when we went to Russia, the plate that they gave us was like super small portions. I'm like, oh, this is it. You got to give me two or three more of these plates. <laughs> yeah. Compared to what we do here. Well, that happens, you know, my mom comes from overseas and mm-hmm. when... We go to a restaurant. She's always overwhelmed, you know, when they put anything in front of her. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, the, just, it's the norm. Yeah. You know? I mean, your, your plate consists of 1,500 to 2,000 calories in one meal. That's way too much. You know, you're supposed yeah. to be consuming. You want to lose weight, 1,500. That's my thing. That's the way I choose to put, push my clients. But you have every trainer has their own way of training people. My thing is 1,500 to 1,800 calories a day, you know, but make sure you put in the good food in your system. You know. Right, because that's the other thing. W- one of the problems with calories has always been that this assumption that, you know, the 200 calories from a bar of chocolate are the same as the 200 calories if you eat, you know, a couple of bananas. Yeah, and they're not. it's completely different. I mean, obviously fruit is natural sugars, but, yeah. you know, and they digest a little bit different in your system. But, I mean, there's so many different things you can do that works for you that might not work for me. And yeah. that's what people have the problem with a lot of times. No, I'm going to do what she does. It might not work with you. Right? you or know. getting fixated on the scale. That's the other one, right, that people do a lot. Listen, you got your bone has a certain mass. Bones, muscles, the whole nine yards. So stop looking at weight and just look at your skin. You know, me, I always tell people to find something that's the super t- the tightest thing in your closet. Put it on every Friday. And the, when it starts getting looser and looser and looser, start looking even better. Forget about the weight because muscle and fat, you know, you'll lose a little bit of fat, but you gain muscle next thing you know, I gain weight. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Muscle weighs more than fat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So stop watching the scale. And how do you how do your clothes fit? Oh, they fit great. Yeah. And one thing that I liked about training with you a lot was uh, you would do a lot of sort of like um, different type of training. Mm-hmm. So there was never that muscle um, memory yeah. with the with the exercises. Like if you do the same thing all the time your body kind of gets used to it and learns how to deal with that difficulty. Mm-hmm. And and with you, there was always something different. So it was always like your body is always like, oh, fuck, something new again? <laughs> Shit. Like I thought we had, you know, we've been doing this for five years, man. How do you come up with a new thing after five years? Yes. And then it's not all the time. Like when we, like I was telling the client yesterday, I said, do 10 minutes on the treadmill, 10 minutes on the elliptical, 10 minutes on the stairs. The next day, 10 minutes on the stairs, 10 minutes on the uh, treadmill, and then 10 minutes on elliptical. I said, just constantly mix it up, you know, because your body knows. It's like, obviously, our, our body's like amazing. Mm-hmm. So it knows what we're going to do before we do it. I mean, not necessarily before we do it, but when we start it, it's just like, all right, guys, we know what we're doing here. Yeah. Grab a hold and just move. But then when you change it up, if you walk in the treadmill, if you switch it up and run backwards on the treadmill, what happens? Your body just like, whoa, this is different. Now we're working different muscles here. It's the little detail stuff, muscle confusion. Confusion muscles as much as possible. Never stay on the same thing. You can do the same thing, but spread them out and mix them up, you know, and add something to that workout also every single time. Yeah, when you're doing the weight loss stuff, um, you incorporate some boxing, but yes. it's mostly going to be just mid-work, bag work, that type of stuff, right? Yeah, like when I, okay, so if you don't like personal training with me, I add a lot of mid-work. Um, we train, we lift weights, we do the normal, you know. Um, I want the mid-work for that way it's confidence that you're building. And it's like a self, the more you do it, obviously you get a little bit of self-awareness, self-confident, you know, um, it's a self-defense also. And you're learning a skill, so your mind is firing up. Exactly. You know, it's very different, weight. you know, because I remember I, we talked about this always when I was training, like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do a lot of the, you know, I'll do box jumps if you want me to do box jumps, but mm-hmm. we need to incorporate something where I feel like my mind's getting stimulated because yes. my mind, when we start doing box jumps, my mind would go into like this hibernation mode, like, oh, okay, we're just fucking jumping on the box, <laughs> click, we're checking out, you know, but when you're go- doing mid work, it's a different world, you know, because yeah. you're having to think about it all the time. Yeah, the constant movement, the angles, and I don't just sit in front of you, I make you turn, move, yeah. roll, you know, catch punches, grab your ear. Right, not to mention, yeah, yeah. Get, you know, the so, occasional, mm-hmm. the occasional pop in the head will will definitely <laughs> get your mind working if you weren't working before then yeah i mean a lot of people try to cheat on the moving the head and i just tap your forehead eventually yeah. it's like a mosquito you'll yeah. get annoyed and you eventually move yeah you know so if i'm constantly doing that throwing it at you you you're moving and you're 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 making me stay in front plus if you fall off balance what you're doing you're working on your balance so you're learning not to fall off balance and you're learning to use your center gravity your lower center gravity you know 
Are you spending more time in the Winter Garden gym or in the Mineola gym? Uh, Mineola, that's my baby. You yeah. know, F Fusion Excel is um, Julian and, and Julian and Edwin's baby. You know, yeah. we all, all three of us own it, but that's their baby. Mm -hmm. You know, like Technique Boxing and Mineola, that's my baby. You know, that's me by myself, and that's my go-to. That's where I spend majority, like, mornings, nights, except Tuesday and Thursday. I'm over here at Fusion Excel and McCoy just to give them that mix-up. You know, um, because each one of us brings something different to the table. Me, boxing, striking, plus I'm a personal trainer. Julian, jiu-jitsu, striking, plus he's a personal trainer. Edwin, striking, plus he's a personal trainer. You know, and we fused together. That's why we came up with fusion, you know. Yeah. So. Um, what, you said you have a fight in November. Um, any other traveling for the rest of the year? So, um, Friday I leave out to Selena, Selena, Kansas. Okay. Um, I come back and I start getting ready for my fight. Um, October 5th, I'm going to Columbus, Georgia for another MMA fight that's going to be on UFC Fight Pass um, with Rashawn. And then I come back November 2nd, I fight at the Yingling Center in Tampa. And then the f in two weeks after that, I'm supposed to be going to Sao Paulo, Brazil. I can't tell you who might be fighting, Yeah, but it's almost done deal. Good. Um, and... I, I definitely wanted to talk about another thing before we, we get done with it because um, you work a lot with kids and like you said, you have some of the top kids in the nation now at your gym. Um, tell us a little bit about them, kind of the age brackets um, and all that good stuff. All right, so we have Pretty Boy Los. Um, he's 14 years old. He's a 95 pounder. Um, we just came back from the Nationals and he got second place. So he's number two in the nation. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. He's, he's the way he moves is incredible. Phenomenal kid. Bright. Um, he's going to be a scholar, man. He's, he's great, man. Um, he's, to me, he's one of the most skilled guys that I have um, because I can put him in any position, you know, and he'll get through it. Um, Gabriel. Um, honey Badger, we call him because he's small. You look at him, oh, this kid's nothing, but you know, Honey Badger. Honey Badger's mm -hmm. not scared of nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, he's number eight in the nation. Um, he's been with me seven years. Carlos has been with me eight years. And Carlos's brother, Joshua, Latin Bomber, he's been with me nine years as well. And Joshua's number nine in the nation. Um, I mean, this, these all three of these kids, they met me when I first opened up my gym. Yeah. You know, so not but Carlos and Joshua. And then Gabe came a year later, but they've been with me ever since. And literally, they call me dad, Yeah, you know, because they like my sons, literally, you know, and they're always with me 24-7. So to watch them grow as, you know, from seven years old and up and to see where they are now, I mean, they're doing great in school. They're A, B, honor roll students, you know. I'm, I imagine, I, I just don't know how to even think about if I wasn't in their life, you know, because yeah. their they're, dad is not in a good position and stuff like that. Um, their mom is trying her best to do keep them guys, you know, on, on a straight path, but with me in there, it helps out a lot. Yeah, of know? course. And, and all that discipline still in boxing and, and discovering new skills and discovering you're really good at something, all of that really helps the formation of a young man mm -hmm. um, or a young lady because you've had a lot of girls come through your boxing school mm -hmm. and fight and be amazing also. So Yeah, Jordan uh, Warning. Yeah, so yeah. It's, not, it's, it's not for your boys only. There's yes. plenty of girls that are out there at Technique Boxing for sure. Yes, I had a female Jordan. Um, In fact, most of, I would say most of your personal training um, with adults, it, would you say it's mostly um, ladies that, that go for that? Yeah, mostly females, yeah. Um, especially with the personal training, yeah. um, which is which is a good thing. You know what I'm saying? I, w I would like my guys to get out there too because we have some heavy set guys out there that think they, they just, you know, I just lift weights, you know, I'm just big. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, mean, I think it's good for anybody. I think it's um, the women especially because I do add boxing in it and, and, and I want them to know it. I don't just hit mitts. Yeah. I teach you. Yeah. I make sure you know it because I can't just, I can't just hit mitts. That's not in, that's, I'm a teacher. Right, 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 right. I want you to do a full blown combination. And if I throw a punch at you, I want you to be able to react and yeah. counter me. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you can hit me and I, cause I want you to be able to see it. It's real life. Yeah. You know, so that way you know how to react. If somebody do do it outside, you're perfectly fine. Yeah. So anyone listening to this technique boxing in Mineola, um, if you're looking for personal training, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or group classes, if you're looking for, um, kids activities you want your kids to learn how to box you want your kids to um, become a little more disciplined and more um, engaged in the activities that they do um, definitely go see JT um, it is it is really a place of love that you're running over there and 
that's why everybody's in, in the area knows you so well um and everybody has always great things to say about you i'm really glad you came over and did this today man thank no you doubt. and i got some specials going right now so all right um, go this is tell the time us that, this is the time to come and see me normal yeah normally, tell us um normally we at like 60 dollars an hour uh, right now we're like half off 35 dollars um, because we want to be able to reach out to more people in the community and get people in shape. Because I want I want the city of Mineola and Claremont to be in shape. Mm-hmm. Let's get everybody in shape. Let's just change the game a little bit. You know, let's show our youth that we we still got it. You know, um, and our youth look up to us. So if they see us doing this, what's going to happen later on down in life? Yeah. They're going to follow our suit. You know, they're going to do the same exact thing we're doing. So why not get out there and show them how the ropes work? So that's why we're going at a lower rate right now. Yeah. Um, just to get more people in the door. Very good. What's your phone number? Uh, 407-715-3648. Um, website, www.technique, T-E-K-N-I-Q-U-E, boxing.com. And trust me, guys, you know, we're a big family, man. We keep it like that. We keep it real. Stink. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, man. No doubt. Man. <laughs>